Stock markets shrug off inflation data that comes in just as expected, not too hot, not too cold. So is this Goldilocks environment going to clear them for another push higher? Well, maybe so, but they're not out of, out of the woods yet. That's what we're going to talk about uh, here on Macro Money. This is Ilya Spivak, head of Global Macro here at Tasty Live. And the focus for us here uh, will be the next big thing to happen in macro world this week after uh, that CPI release out of the U.S. today. And that'll be a speech from Fed Chair Jerome Powell. Now, you might be asking yourself, what is Powell doing giving markets guidance when we just had a Fed, uh, a Fed policy announcement last week? Why do we need to do this again a week later? But therein is the interesting thing. Why indeed? So first, let's consider the impact of the CPI report. Let's see uh, what it did and why. Uh, and then uh, consider what Fed Chair Powell might do on top of what we've seen already, the implications for financial markets going forward, and some trading setups that may emerge as a consequence. So first of all, here is CPI. Uh, we can see here exactly in line with expectations, 3.3% on the core reading, 2.6% on the headline. Those were exactly the numbers that uh, had uh, the sort of median view summarized uh, as economists threw their forecasts into the hat, as it were. Uh, there's lots of aggregators, so maybe you saw some slight differences. The Reuters average versus, let's say, the Bloomberg average uh, might have been different here or there, but the upshot remains the same. These numbers were basically e exactly as the markets uh, anticipated from the directional perspective it is the core numbers that are the most important uh, in very sort of clear terms here. We can see the service sector inflation overwhelmingly is where sticky price growth remains. Uh, it is negligible uh, at this point in food. It is negative in energy. It is negative in goods. So it is that core inflation in the service sector, that thing where the Fed still has some agency, unlike global energy and food prices, where uh, we get the market moving part of this data. And as expected, this is the fourth consecutive month without inflation going down. October matched September. September was a rise on August. August was a repeat of July. So we've now seen four consecutive months of inflation not falling. And this is really the main takeaway from these numbers as we go forward. Now, the response from financial markets was interesting. Perhaps the most uh, interesting bit happened in the bond market and in currencies because stock markets didn't quite know what to make of it. Initially, there was a bit of a stocks rally around relief that the numbers were not hotter. You might recall yesterday, the markets uh, were a little bit soggier as yields rose and the dollar rose and gold fell. And there was this sense that the markets were positioning for upside surprise uh, risk on CPI. They ultimately didn't get it. And so when they didn't get it, stock markets popped a bit, uh, yields shifted lower a bit. But with the benefit of uh, a little bit of digestion, mere hours later, Stocks came back to essentially nothing, no change really for the S&P 500 or for the NASDAQ. The yield curve steepened, where long rates went up, but short rates cooled off, seemingly suggesting that we got through the near-term risk that the CPI numbers represented. If we were going to end up at 3.4, 3.5, or some other higher than expected core inflation number, one could reasonably conclude that maybe the Fed was not going to cut rates again as expected in December. 
once we got the numbers exactly in line, that rate cut in December came back into expectations. In fact, we can see that here. This is uh, from the CME uh, derived from Fed funds futures, uh, which give you a sense of where the markets are pricing in Fed monetary policy. And you can see here is the column for the likelihood that we get a rate cut in December. As you can see, it's now a little bit over 80 percent. Yesterday, just a day ago, it was less than 60. You can see the same thing uh, here. So the likelihood that we would stay at the current policy setting, which is this right here, yesterday was a bit over 40 percent. Today is a bit under 20. In other words, the markets have readjusted to put the December rate cut back as a strong favorite for where policy goes next. That explains this right here. Crude oil, as ever, marching to the beat of its own drum here. But in conjunction with this shifting, this steepening of the yield curve, which now is as steep as it was on the day after the election last week, so the steepest in a week, we likewise get further weakness in gold and further strength in the U.S. dollar, both the euro and the yen as kind of stand-ins for major currencies, both of them down, and major currencies in general, down uh, against the dollar, which at this point, uh, against an average of its major counterparts, is at the strongest level since May. So the markets seemingly looked at this and said, OK, maybe we get the December cut, but we are still looking, broadly speaking, at a trajectory for Fed policy that is much less dovish than we thought. And that, of course, follows the heating up of the U.S. economy, which we can readily see in this shift in the way that U.S. economic data has performed relative to expectations. We've talked about it extensively here on the show over recent weeks. This is an index from Citigroup. It measures economic data surprises. When the index is above zero, that means uh, U.S. news flow in this case tends to beat relative to forecasts. And what we see from late August is, first, the gap favoring downside surprises closes. We arrive at neutral. We break through where the momentum, which is really what this measures behind U U.S. economic data, is getting increasingly positive to the point where not only is it now showing that U.S. data tends to be beating expectations, it also suggests that the margin by which it is doing it is growing implying the economy is accelerating faster than analysts' models are being adjusted to reflect that strength. So, by all accounts, the economy is moving to a hotter setting. And you see that reflected in the overall trajectory of policy expectations. Not a whole lot of change for this year. We still have the one meeting left. And the likelihood of a cut there has clearly firmed up a little bit. But when we look at what's going on for next year, we have dramatically reduced the scope for easing. We now look uh, at futures Im uh, implying just 55 basis points in cuts. That's two cuts next year. When the Fed last update, uh, updated its forecast, that was mid-September, it said there's going to be twice that. At the same time, the markets were at five cuts. So this is a very significant shift in how much easing is actually on the menu going forward. The price action that we see today after CPI reinforces that point, even as it puts the December cut back on the menu. Now, as far as the impact of all of this on markets, where it's been certainly uh, unmistakable is the dollar. Gold has had a bit of an uneven 
relationship with this and has really only come back to its senses since the election. And as we'll see in just a moment, stocks are of two minds in their relationship with policy expectations. But where the situation is clear as day is in the dollar, which quite simply says, oh, so you are going to diminish my yield appeal less than previously thought, which would make me more attractive relative to other currencies. Okay, I'll go up. And that's, of course, exactly what we see here. As expectations for the Fed become less dovish, the dollar soars. The perspective from stock markets is a little bit more complicated. We see extensive periods where more Fed easing helps stocks and less Fed easing hurts them. We likewise see periods where things move in tandem. For example, when the Fed starts to talk about they're done hiking rates and they're thinking about cuts, now exactly a year ago, we see that as things get more dovish, stocks find a bottom and rise. Come the beginning of the year, we can see that we can have fewer rate cuts in the outlook. We go from six cuts here to just three cuts by the time we get to uh, mid-April or so. And stocks, for the most part, are moving higher. They swoon a little bit as we get from March into April, and we start to see this relationship become inverted. So this last bit of hawkish readjustment, stocks actually don't like it. Once things settle and things uh, start to get more dovish again, stocks go up. That continues until July, where they are able to move together again, but this time on the downside. That follows from what happens with U.S. economic data at the time. Consider this very index once again. What is it that's happening at the start of this year? Well, U.S. economic data is strengthening. This is January. This is mid-April. It would only make sense, perhaps, that in an environment where U.S. economic data is getting better, that the giving away of rate cuts is not thought of as a bad thing. After all, we're giving away rate cuts because the economy is strong. It doesn't need cuts. It's doing well. So as we get this period, again, first quarter going into the second, we're able to have fewer cuts in the outlook and stronger stocks all the same up to a point when rates get high enough stock markets wobble fast forward to July what do we see in July by then US economic data has been deteriorating since mid-April to significant lows that's when the Fed finally comes out and says they're actually going to get to cutting not surprisingly, the market looks at this and says, oh, well, data has already been deteriorating, which is why we've been making for a more dovish outlook going all the way back to mid-April, early May. You've recognized an issue, which means that perhaps a recession is already inescapable. You've been late on this for months. Stocks go down. As this stabilizes, we once again get a parallel rise. And now, decision time seems to have arrived again. So the question is, can stocks continue to go up? Is this change in the rate structure to a more hawkish setting more reminiscent of this, where these things can go higher at the same time? Or is it more reminiscent of this? where things move inversely. And a key difference seems to emerge from the cyclical consideration. This is the World Purchasing Manager Index data from 
JP Morgan and S&P Global. What this does is basically takes together all of the PMI numbers that S&P publishes for the individual countries and gives you a global state of growth. And as ever with PMI numbers, above 50 is growth, below 50 is contraction. The further you go above 50, the faster the growth. The further you go below 50, the faster the contraction. We can see the manufacturing sector is in contraction mode. This is uh, October's update here. You can see it marked a little bit of an improvement for uh, all involved, a little bit faster on uh, services. That's this yellow line here, a little bit uh, less uh, of a uh, vigorous con uh, contraction for manufacturing. You can see the pace of contraction eases here. So we go from being more below 50 to less below 50, as it were. And what that does for the composite index that brings these things together is gives it a little bit faster growth in October relative to September. However, September was an eight-month low. The last time we were anywhere near levels like this was back here in January. And so the trajectory for global growth, upticks like this, shallow ones notwithstanding, has been down even as the U.S. has improved. And that is because if we look at these inflation numbers once again, we can clearly see where the demand is. Why is it that services has all the inflation? Where does inflation come from? When there is demand for goods or services, and there is a finite supply at the margin of those goods and services, at least in the moment, then people compete on price to get them. Where there is demand, there is then a bidding up of prices. So to see inflation stuck in services and virtually nowhere else tells you the buoyant U.S. economy is being driven by the service sector even as other parts of it are basically anemic. Well, that service sector mainly represents domestic demand. Those services companies that are being spent on are domestic companies, which means that the very powerful U.S. economy, envy of the world as it is, is not spilling over into demand elsewhere. Consider, if nothing else, the dire straits that the Canadian economy finds itself in. It exports 80% of everything it sells across its border to the U.S. This kind of strength in the U.S. should be, if nothing else, very positive for Canada. And that's simply not what we're seeing. Because the U.S. is busy spending on itself, while the rest of the world is slowing. This represents a very significant challenge now that the spotlight turns, as we mentioned at the top of the show, to this speech from Fed Chair Powell. Now, we didn't get the spook from CPI, but we could get it from him. We got just from the press conference last week that the Fed recognizes the economy is hotter, recognizes that inflation expectations are marching higher, recognizes that the markets have shifted to a lower rate cuts posture in the outlook because of all these things. And the message from the Fed was, just in case you're thinking we're on dovish autopilot, stop it. We are not. We still want to get the 2% inflation, and we will act if we need to. We do not have to cut rates just because we said we would before. If things are going to be uh, an issue with the path back to 2%, we will act accordingly. We will dial back cuts. We will pause them. We will reduce scope. All of those things. The message a week later is unlikely to be much different. That we need another message a week later seems to point to the direction that there's something to say, 
This is one of those formal U.S. economic outlook updates that the Fed chair does but a few times a year. Interesting that he finds the need to give one now since we just had the press conference where he basically did the same thing only a week ago. So the direction of travel must, looking at the economy, imply that in the wake of CPI now, perhaps with the benefit of having seen inflation stall for a fourth consecutive, disinflation stall, I should say, uh, for a fourth consecutive month, perhaps we get more hawkish rhetoric. Well, at a time when the global economy is slowing, that is unwelcome and fundamentally different from what we saw over here. Consider that the March higher in U.S. rates, that's the green line there, has been echoed with near perfection by an average of rates outside of the U.S. in the major economies, Germany to represent the Eurozone, the U.K., Australia, Japan. And that's because the U.S. dollar is ubiquitous in global commerce. Close to 88% of global monetary transactions are settled in dollars. Because the dollar is so liquid, it is often cheaper to trade even from one non-U.S. dollar currency into another through the dollar rather than directly. And so overwhelmingly, the cost of doing business the world over is denominated in dollars. So when the Fed increases the cost of borrowing dollars with domestic considerations in mind, or when those borrowing costs rise because they anticipate the Fed is not going to be as dovish as expected, that would be this right here, global rates rise just as the U.S. rates do. And all that's fine and good for the strong U.S. economy, where it makes sense, but less so for the global economy, which is barely off an eight-month low on economic activity growth. Now, this presents a very different scenario than the beginning of this year where global growth was accelerated, and in fact on its way to what in May would be a 12-month high. We might say, okay, so the U.S. is powerful and growing strong, but that's not extending beyond its borders. The global economy is slowing, and now we are going to raise borrowing costs on that global economy. Why is this a risk? Surely, as the U.S. continues to grow, it will eventually begin to spill over. And maybe so. But the problem, as it was just updated from the uh, I International Institute of Finance that puts out the global debt monitor tracking global debt conditions, we find we are ending the year with a record for outstanding global debt. That's both public and private debt globally at $315 trillion dollars. We also know that in the inflation years, 2021, 2022, the debt to GDP ratio, which is to say the affordability of the debt, do you have enough growth to service it, has been inflated away, but this has stopped as inflation has cooled. If we jack up rates, at a time when the global economy is slowing, that debt-to-GDP ratio will start rising again. And it will pressure global economies, broadly speaking. So the question now is, in a global slowdown with tightening credit conditions, do stocks remain resilient? And if Fed Chair Powell takes a hawkish tack and bids up yields again, we may well learn that the answer is no. And that is Macro Money for today. Uh, as ever, we are here Monday through Thursday, right after Overtime, a show that I co-host with Dylan Radigan and Chris Vecchio, looking at the Wall Street close and where things may follow therefrom.
I am on with Victor Jones for the price of truth. This week on Tuesday, that's yesterday, usually on Wednesdays. I am on with Chris for Futures Power Hour, Mondays and Fridays. On with Victor and Tom for First Call on Sundays. Writing for the News and Insights portion of TastyLive.com and opining sporadically on the platform formerly known as Twitter, at Ilya Spivak. Thanks very much for joining. Macro Money is back tomorrow.